a book that I can't recommend highly enough uh, to folks out there. It's by a guy named Anand Gopal, and it's called No Good Men Among the Living, uh, which is a, a, pa a Pashto phrase uh, that he liked and that, that he used as, as his title. What he describes in the book is rather startling. Shortly after the U.S. invaded, after September 11, 2001, uh, the Taliban uh, put up a fight for a few days, in some places a few weeks, and then they melted away. Uh, commanders across Afghanistan fled, uh, threw down their weapons, and went back to civilian life. Uh, Mullah Omar, that Taliban leader, tried to fight on uh, for a little while, held, held a huge meeting in Kandahar with uh, in Kandahar with a lot of his uh, top of top officials and lieutenants and and urged them to continue the fight and they said no they said this fight is over uh, they, they they witnessed uh, the, the the disparity of the force that the United States had versus the Taliban when when you have air power uh, it is simply impossible to fight a conventional war if the other side doesn't have, if, if, if you don't have any. In other words, you'd have these long lines of Taliban trucks, uh, you know, those, these famous white Toyotas that you see in conflicts all, all over the world, and they'd be heading from uh, one town to the next, and you can't hide these convoys. And uh, U U.S. fighter jets would see them and just annihilate them. And it only took... Uh, a, a handful of those moments for the Taliban leadership to say, you know what, this is over. We're done. Now for centuries, maybe millennia in Afghanistan, when one power uh, or one faction kind of took, took power or won a conflict against a rival, they would then surrender, negotiate, and they would, and they would share power going forward. Sometimes that share would be 99 to one or 100 to zero, uh, but they wouldn't leave the country. You know, these are, you know, these are clans that have been in Afghanistan since time immemorial. And so when you're at war with your neighbor and the war ends, your neighbor doesn't leave. The U.S. eventually will leave as we left Vietnam uh, and as one day we'll leave Iraq. But the, to take the Iraqi example, the Shia and the Sunni aren't leaving. You know, they're there. They are neighbors. They live there. And so the Taliban assumed that this process was going to go the same way that it had gone for centuries before, that they would surrender, they'd come to the table, they'd negotiate some, some sort of uh, immunity uh, from, from uh, prosecution and getting hanged or whatever, whatever it was. Uh, and they they were they were completely rebuffed the united states said no we we will not accept um surrender terms and anything less than uh un unconditionally at times uh senior taliban figures attempted to unconditionally surrender and the the, the warlords in the united states were so disorganized that they couldn't even find people to ex to accept their surrender and this is all spelled out in a non Paul's book, uh, no, good man, uh, no Good Men Among the Living, which I recommend every, everybody check out. And so after, after a long time of this happening, eventually an insurgency did start again. But why did it start? Okay, the United States had refused to accept the surrender of the Taliban. So therefore, in the mind of the United States, the Taliban was at war with the, with the United States Army and with the Afghan government there. The problem was that wasn't actually true. Even though the surrender wasn't accepted, the Taliban gave up anyway. They they went back to uh, they went back to civilian life. They went back to the towns where they came from, or some of them uh, f uh, fled to fled to Pakistan. They were not fighting back against U.S. forces for about a year or so after we were in there. But the U.S. forces needed body bags. They needed to be able to show that they were making progress in the quote-unquote war on terror. So what do you, how do you kill terrorists if there are no terrorists left in the country? Well, if you have money to buy dead terrorists, you know, uh, demand has a way of creating its own supply. And so you had these Afghan warlords who were allied with the U.S. Army over there, and then they'd say, oh, Five thousand, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars for information on the Taliban. Okay, guess what? That guy over there, 
he's Taliban. He wasn't Taliban, but he was some type of a rival with whatever warlord the U.S. was associated with. And so, boom, they would kick in the doors of this guy that was just narked out to them as being Taliban, and the original guy would get the $100,000 reward or whatever it was. Now, that guy's brother is mad at the original warlord, and he'd go to the U.S. Army and say, hey, that warlord that you're working with, guess what? He's actually Taliban. The U.S. had no understanding whatsoever of the, of the culture or the language or, or the players in the, pol- in, the, in, in the deeply complicated politics. So they'd be like, oh, really? Okay. And then they'd go get that guy, too. There are numerous instances of non-Taliban people being in Guantanamo who turned each other in just because they were rivals with each other, and none of them were Taliban. Uh, and so, some Taliban did go to Guantanamo, and they would. Uh, and in the book, they're, they, they're, these Taliban are amused to see their old enemies, who are these American allied warlords, also sent to Guantanamo. Taliban say, "See, this is what you get for signing up w- with the Americans. They sent you to uh, Guantanamo, just like they sent us to uh, sent us to Guantanamo." And so there were all of these ind- indiscriminate raids that were taking place based on faulty intelligence that we were paying for and we were paying to make intel- make faulty uh, created uh, a level of fear and instability that then uh, gave rise to the new Taliban insurgency. The Taliban said, okay, look, if, if you're not going to accept our surrender and if we're going to put our weapons down and one day we're just going to get our door randomly kicked in, now, now, I'm a, now I'm a watchmaker, for instance, or I'm, I'm, I'm repairing cell phones, which is uh, what one of the former Taliban fighters does in the book. You're going to come into my shop and you're going to, and you're going to steal all my stuff. You're going to grab me. You're going to torture me uh, because I used to be Taliban. Well, you know what? I've got a better idea. Why don't I actually continue to be Taliban? And so the, insur- and so the insurgency was created. Liberals are not blameless in this. In 2002 and 2003, many, many liberals were opposed to the invasion of Iraq and, and protested against it, uh, marched against it, and, and good for them. But uh, a, a lot of liberals have to say to other people, they have to say, well, look, I'm not a pacifist. I'm okay with some wars. And what liberals often do is they, they will say that they're for a war they don't think is going to be fought, so they can seem tough and be against the war that is currently being fought. Say, yes, I'm against the war in Iraq, but uh, I'm for the war in Afghanistan. And the war in Afghanistan was easy to justify in people's minds. A, they had, they had sheltered the, ta- the uh, Al-Qaeda, which had killed you know, 3,000 plus Americans, and B, they were this uh, just brutal, you know, pre-modern regime that was beheading people in soccer fields, blowing up uh, Buddhist towers, uh, oppressing uh, women in the in the, the, the most uh, draconian ways that anybody could possibly imagine. They were banning music. You couldn't have a you couldn't have TVs. You know, it was it was it was an absurd dystopia and easy to say yes we should go to war against them. Uh, in fact, it like I said it they fell in a week or two, uh, and so now we are talking about a different war. And so liberals would say yeah I am. Uh, and Obama's quote was, I'm not against all wars, I'm against dumb wars. And so when Obama was running for president in 08, he said, I'm going to get us out of Iraq and I'm going to refocus our attention on Afghanistan. That was a big thing. That liberals said, well, we, we ignored Afghanistan and that's why it went to hell. When in fact, the places without a U.S. troop presence are the places that are the most stable today and never had an insurgency They couldn't have an insurgency against U.S. troops because they weren't there, and they didn't have an insurgency against the Afghan government because without U.S. power, the Afghan government didn't have enough power to destabilize the region, and it forced actors who were there and were rivals to come to a negotiated settlement. But if you don't have to come to a negotiated settlement with your neighbor, and you can instead call in special forces and have your neighbor taken to Guantanamo, that's often going to be your preference. Think about that. Think about the worst neighbor you've had throughout your life. If you could pick up the phone and get them dragged to Guantanamo, all right, you probably wouldn't do it, right? Some people, some people would. My neighbors might have had me dragged to Guantanamo if they could. And so Obama gets elected. 2009, he announces he's going to do a troop surge. And so he sends a 
ton of ton, 30,000 new troops to Afghanistan. At the same time, he announces, we're going to leave as soon as these guys get there. And then he starts drawing down and focuses instead on night raids. Uh, and these, these night raids are, are driven by the same faulty intelligence that led to all of these uninvolved people getting picked up and thrown in Gitmo or killed or tortured uh, in, in the first place. And unsurprisingly, now more than half the country or so uh, is controlled by the Taliban, meaning that we pull off what is almost uh, inconceivable. We're losing a war to an enemy that already surrendered.